Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Frederick Reamer, who is a professor in the School of Social Work at Rhode Island College for over 30 years. Dr. Reamer chaired the National Task Force that wrote the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics that was adopted in 1996 and served on the task force that recently added the technology-related standards. He lectures nationally and internationally on the subjects of professional ethics and professional malpractice and liability. Dr. Reamer is the author of many books, including the seminal work, Boundary Issues and Dual Relationships in the Human Services, which was recently released in its third edition and is the topic we will discuss today. Dr. Reamer, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you for having me. Can you start by explaining boundary issues in social work as they relate to dual relationships and why it is important that social workers think proactively about how to manage them? Boundary issues are quite complex, and I would say they were introduced into the social work literature in the 1980s when We began to appreciate the complexity associated with what we sometimes call dual relationships or in some contexts, multiple relationships. And boundary issues occur when social workers relate to clients in more than one relationship. Now, those relationships with clients could be professional. So, for example, a former client who decides to go to social work school and becomes a colleague or we encounter a client in the community. Some of us live in relatively small rural communities, perhaps. And it's not a question of if we bump into clients in the community. It's more likely when we bump into clients in the community or our relatives or friends with our clients. So there could be some kind of social connection there. And then finally, boundary issues that involve business transactions. I've been involved as an expert witness in several cases that were brought before licensing boards where the evidence indicated that the social worker entered into an unethical business relationship with a client or a former client. Now, dual or multiple relationships can occur simultaneously or consecutively. In other words, I could have a client right now who is also dating a friend of mine. So that's happening simultaneously or it can be consecutive. My agency might consider hiring my former client. So I have to manage that so-called consecutive dual relationship. Another example would be in the digital age, as I like to call it, a social worker might receive a Facebook friend request from a current client. So that's a simultaneous potential dual relationship. One could also receive a Facebook friend request from a former client two years after termination. So that would be an example of a consecutive dual relationship. Now, there are colleagues of mine, Gutheil and Brodsky, who defined boundary issues as involving, and this is their terminology, which I, I really like, A boundary is the edge of appropriate behavior at a given moment in the relationship between a client and therapist as governed by the therapeutic context and contract. So I love that image of the edge of appropriate behavior, the edge. And I think our challenge is trying to figure out where that edge is. And I think that edge differs for different social workers, different social work contexts, roles, client populations, and we can get into that. Now, with regard to your question about why it's important, on one hand, I think Wrestling with issues related to professional boundaries and dual relationships, multiple relationships, is important in order to protect clients. I'm someone who spends a great deal of his time serving as what courts call an expert witness in both litigation cases where social workers and their agencies might be sued, and also in licensing board cases where a disgruntled client or usually by then a former client files a licensing board complaint alleging an ethics-related problem. And a very significant percentage of these lawsuits and a very significant percentage of these licensing board complaints, not all, but a very significant percentage, involve allegations that the social worker did not exercise good judgment with regard to the management of boundary issues. And I've testified in cases where clients were harmed by social workers' poor judgment regarding boundary management. So my First priority, 
is protection of clients. But close behind that is protection of social workers and their supervisors and their agencies. So the answer to your question about why is it important? Number one, clear boundaries, protect clients. Number two, clear boundaries, protect us as social workers, our agencies, and so on in instances where disgruntled parties contemplate filing or actually file a lawsuit or a licensing board complaint. What is the difference between a boundary crossing and a boundary violation? This is a distinction which has been in the ethics literature for quite some time. And I think put simply, a boundary crossing involves acceptable, perhaps inevitable or unavoidable door relationships. So examples would be, you're a social worker who lives in a small rural community where it's virtually impossible to avoid a dual relationship with a client. Your children who are nine years old, you each have a child who's nine years old, and your children attend the same school. There's only one in your small town, and they are in the same third grade classroom and they're friends. Well, you can't control that. You have to manage that boundary carefully. And that would be an example of a boundary crossing. Or your agency, your mental health agency, your substance use disorder treatment program hires someone as a peer support specialist. This is someone with lived experience who has managed challenging circumstances related to mental illness or substance use and abuse. And your former client has been hired by your agency to be a peer support specialist, which is fine. However, you're now attending staff meetings with your former client, and you're relating to that person now as a colleague. So that's a boundary crossing. It might be acceptable. It might be unavoidable because it may not have been your decision. Another example, most social workers encounter clients who are curious about social workers' lives. Clients who ask questions along the lines of, so how old are you? Let's say you're a relatively young social worker and you look relatively young and you're advising the parent of a child who's having a difficult time managing the child's behavior. And your client is curious, well, how old are you? Do you have any children? They're asking because they want to know what your experience is as a parent, if any, because that might be relevant to the counseling. And so that's a question about your personal life that invites self-disclosure. Or you might be working in a substance use disorder program and a client who's in recovery asks you, are you in recovery? And we know that many substance use disorder treatment programs include staff who themselves are in recovery. That's part of the model there because they have lived experience, which can be very helpful. Well, social workers have to make difficult decisions about self-disclosure. In the book that you mentioned, my book on boundary issues and dual relationships, I have a whole section on boundary crossings pertaining to self-disclosure. When is it appropriate to share personal information about one's own life? When is it not appropriate? How do you figure out where the edge of that boundary is? And so those are examples of boundary crossing. Another instance in the digital age, I know for a fact that a significant and I would say growing number of clients search online for information about their social workers because they're curious. And I'm not critical, right? No judgment there. It's, I think, perfectly understandable human curiosity. So they go online and they conduct Google searches or they conduct Facebook or LinkedIn searches and they want to know who you are, where do you live, information about your background. They might search on Facebook to see if there are any photos of you. They might be curious to know if you own a house or whether you're a registered Republican or Democrat, particularly during an intense political season. And so you don't have control over that. And clients may learn information about your personal life and they may bring it up in a clinical session. Gee, you know what I found out about you on the internet? And you're thinking, oh boy, here we go. And that's a boundary crossing and you have to then figure out how to manage that. In contrast, are boundary violations. Boundary violations involve what I would describe as unacceptable exploitation of clients or blatant conflicts of interest. So examples would be, the more extreme cases, and I've testified in a number of these cases around the United States, where a former client, and it's nearly always a former client at that point, files a lawsuit. 
against a clinical social worker or files a licensing board complaint for both, alleging a boundary violation. Boundary violation in the form of having developed an intimate relationship, the social worker and the former client, involving sex. That's a boundary violation, right? So I would say that's not a boundary crossing, that's a boundary violation. Or a situation where a social worker enters into a business relationship with a client. This is a real case, by the way, one that I testified in, where the social worker literally wrote a check to the client to become an investor in the client's business, a business that the client had talked about in therapy, about taking this risk, taking this leap, developing a new business, having to raise capital for this business, and actually invites the social worker to become an investor. And the social worker said yes and wrote a check. I had to actually comment on the physical check that was introduced as a piece of evidence in that hearing. And I had to testify about that, in my opinion, boundary violation. Then there are some cases where I think the circumstances kind of straddle both boundary crossings and violations. I've been involved in several cases where an agency director or assistant director hires a former client of that very agency sometime after termination of services. And there are allegations that relationship disrupts for a number of reasons. The former client who's now an employee may have some job performance issues, has to be disciplined, even fired. And then goes back and files a complaint against that agency alleging that the agency failed in its duty to maintain clear boundaries. The agency allowed the client's former therapist at that agency when that individual was a client to become that person's job supervisor when that person was then hired to work at that mental health or substance use disorder program. And in one case, I had to testify about whether that constituted a boundary problem because the relationship morphed. It shifted from clinical social worker, client to supervisor, employee. And the former client testified about how it was devastating to be criticized, to be judged, to be disciplined by her former therapist, who was now her job supervisor several years later. And I think that case included elements of both boundary crossings, hiring a former client, which, by the way, I would not prohibit. I think there are some circumstances where that's reasonable, although I think it has to be done, consistent with prevailing ethical standards, avoiding conflicts of interest and boundary problems. But I think it also included elements of a boundary violation because I think that client was, in that particular case, exploited in her new role as an employee. Is there ever a therapeutic justification for crossing professional boundaries? Well, I think there is. And one of the things I argue is that dual relationships are not necessarily unethical. My opinion is some dual relationships or multiple relationships are unethical and some are not. And I think the ones that are not unethical fall into two categories. One is where the dual relationship emerged. Again, a good example would be living and working in a small community rural community. I've also, over the years, done a lot of training, ethics training for social workers and other behavioral health professionals on military bases around the world. So I've had the opportunity and the privilege to travel to military bases on multiple occasions in Japan and South Korea and in Italy and a number of places. And I meet with social workers and others whose job is to provide clinical services to active duty military personnel and to their family members, if they're on what we call a company tours of duty, I hear over and over and over again about how those social workers and their colleagues encounter boundary challenges because they're often living and working in these very small military bases. So if they go to the base swimming pool, their client could be in lane three and they're in lane six. They encounter them in the locker room, in the shower. They go to the exchange which is the store. You call it the exchange on a military base. And they see them in aisle eight kind of thing. 
They go to a mess hall and there's the client. And it's hard to avoid this, particularly if you're in a military base in a remote area where it's just not safe to go off base because of conflict. I recently provided training to social workers who are stationed on a U.S. aircraft carrier. And the aircraft carrier during our training was located in the middle of the South China Sea. And the clinical social worker's job is to be the social worker for over 5,000 people on that aircraft carrier in the middle of the South China Sea or wherever it happens to be at any moment. There is no way in the world that those social workers can avoid boundary problems. They're living on a ship in the middle of a South China Sea. You can't get away. So in answer to your question, I think sometimes these circumstances are simply unavoidable, but also I think sometimes they are actually desirable. So for example, I mentioned instances where a former client who has a lived experience struggling with mental health issues, persistent chronic schizophrenia or depression that's being managed quite well, or struggles with co-occurring issues where there are also substance use challenges involved. And this is someone who has a great deal to offer to other folks. And I think there is a compelling argument for hiring people with lived experience, former clients, to work in some programs. I think it's justifiable. But as I said a little while ago, I think it has to be done very carefully. You've got to thread the needle with regard to avoiding conflicts of interest in that setting, avoiding inappropriate dual relationships, managing confidential information in that setting. My point is, I think there are some good arguments to be made that sometimes inviting door relationships is defensible and appropriate. Here's another example. I referred earlier to issues involving self-disclosure. In my opinion, and I discussed this in the book on boundaries, there's an important distinction between what I call judicious self-disclosure and what I call gratuitous self-disclosure. What do I mean by that? I think that there are times when it's appropriate clinically, therapeutically, for a social worker to share selective, carefully selected information with a client. For example, working with a seven-year-old whose beloved pet just died. And the seven-year-old, who also had a parent who died, is devastated. And the social worker empathizes and says, you know, when I was about your age, I had this cat. Her name was Kitsy. And oh, I love that cat. And I remember how sad I was when my cat died. Well, that's self-disclosure. And I would argue that's a reasonable form of self-disclosure. That's justifiable. I know some social workers who are in recovery, who work in programs where the model invites selective, carefully considered self-disclosure up to a point. I call that judicious self-disclosure. Always thinking, why am I sharing this information? Whose needs are being met here? There's a lovely Latin phrase, qui bono, spelled C-U-I-B-O-N-O. Qui bono, translation, for whose benefit? Why am I sharing this information? For whose benefit? I think we should always be cognizant of that. But I also consult on a number of licensing board cases and litigation cases where, in my opinion, the social worker shared too much information. It was inappropriate. It crossed a line. I'll give you one example. Several years ago, I testified in a case in the Midwest. The case involved a clinical social worker who worked at an outpatient clinic that provided services to clients with trauma histories. This social worker, I'm embarrassed to say, disclosed a great deal of information about himself and about his marriage. And he, through text messages, through email messages, all of which became evidence, by the way, we call that ESI, electronically stored information, through these text messages, through email messages, and what he shared verbally with his clients. He groomed them. He cultivated relationships with them that were intimate in nature. And part of his MO, modus operandi, was to self-disclose. And that kind of hooked several of his clients, women. Long story short, this clinical social worker developed 
sexual relationships with at least three of his traumatized clients. I had to testify in that case. And the evidence that I testified about included self-disclosure. Well, that's not judicious self-disclosure. That's gratuitous and clearly unethical. So I think the challenge for clinical social workers is to try to sort out when a dual relationship that could manifest itself in working with a former client, self-disclosure, hiring a former client, those kinds of things, when it's defensible, appropriate, justifiable, and when it's unethical. Dr. Reamer, there's a debate in the field of social work surrounding dual relationships, where some believe they are to be avoided at all costs, and others feel that they should be viewed both situationally and contextually. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I don't think they can be avoided at all costs. I think it's impossible. I think some of them can be avoided, and some of them we ought to try to avoid at all costs. Example, developing a sexual relationship with a client, that's a no-brainer. Not that everybody abides by that rule. Most people do. The vast majority do, of course. Very few don't. But I've testified in cases where they don't. But I do think that we always need to consider the context. So I want to pick up on that word that you use, context or contextual. And I think the norms related to boundaries should vary. They do vary from context to context. Let me give you an example. I have spent many years working in prison. You know, I'm a social work professor and I have been for many, many years. And I've also spent many years working in prisons. That's my primary area of interest in social work outside of the work I do related to ethics. And I've worked with, met with thousands, literally thousands, rough guess, 25,000 or so, literally, inmates, prison inmates. And some of them will ask questions about my personal life. And I am very careful about what I disclose in that context. In a prison context, the norms around self-disclosure are very strict. Now, I have shared some modest things with inmates, mindful of the fact that I'm working in a prison. And the norm is staff should not share personal details with inmates ordinarily. However, if I got a job in a substance use disorder program, the norms would be quite different. Where, as I said earlier, we know that in many of those programs, and I dare say most, there are some people on staff who are in recovery, where the boundaries are much more elastic. And I think that's an important word. By design, because of that context, the boundaries are more elastic. And I think ought to be where staff are expected, if they're in recovery, to share some details Not, you know, very intimate details. You've got to know where to draw that line. But it's expected in that context in a way that it's not in a prison setting. I'll give you another example. Over the years, I've done some research on programs that provide treatment for high-risk adolescents. Adolescents who are in deep trouble, struggling teens, we might call them, who are having difficulty in school, difficulty with their parents. They may be rather defiant. The parents have tried individual counseling, family counseling, and you name it, they've tried it. They have transferred the kid from the public school to a private school, the private school for kids with special needs, yada, yada, yada. Well, I know of many families that decided, after consulting with professionals, to place their child in a wilderness therapy program. And I think... There are a lot of really good ones out there. It's kind of like an outward bound model, but with therapy wrapped around it in a very thoughtful way. They're also called outdoor behavioral health programs, either wilderness programs or outdoor behavioral health. And literally, these, you know, 15, 16 year olds, whatever, will go from their home in Piscataway, New Jersey on Thursday and by Friday, They are enrolled in a program in Utah. A lot of these programs are out west, not all of them, but a lot of them. 
And they're staffed by clinical social workers, by psychiatrists, mental health counselors, substance use disorder specialists. And these kids will spend six, seven, eight weeks in the wilderness or in the desert. They're in nobody's office. They're having counseling every single day or six days a week, individual counseling, family sessions by satellite phone. I'm not making this up. The social workers and their behavioral health colleagues meet with these kids in the field, in the desert, in the forest. They literally have, and I've seen it because it's part of my research. I actually went out and saw it with my own eyes. They're sitting under a tree having a therapy session in the middle of nowhere. It's raining. They put up a tarp or a lean-to to protect themselves, and they continue with their therapy session. And at the end of the day, they are so far away from the agency's office. It's like a 50-minute drive in a Jeep. The social worker sleeps over. Sleeps over. So you find this context where the boundaries by design are very elastic. And that is part of the model. They are having meals together. Social workers typically don't have meals with their clients. They're not sleeping right next to each other, but they're sleeping over in the same territory. And the wilderness therapy model, the outdoor behavioral health model, calls for, by necessity, more elastic boundaries. So compare that to what I've observed in my work in prisons. (laughs) These are worlds apart with regard to boundary norms. Now, has social workers and clients increased use of online and other digital technology introduced new boundary issues? Oh, let me count the ways. (laughs) When I started my career, no such thing as the internet, Google searches, Facebook searches, LinkedIn searches, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, none of it. Now we know that a very large percentage of social workers are using technology to do several things. They are providing services to clients remotely. Now, a lot of these social workers were doing this before we ever heard of COVID-19 or the pandemic. But because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, a significant number of clinical social workers had to pivot using technology, video platforms, texting, email, telephone to serve clients remotely, some of whom they never meet in person. We're also using technology to communicate with clients in ways we never did before, right? Some of us started our careers where you talk to a client on a telephone that had a cord attached to the handset or face-to-face, and that was pretty much it. Now, of course, we can communicate with clients via apps on our smartphone where there are embedded messaging options within the app or online social networking or who knows what. We can search for information about clients online using Google or Bing or LinkedIn or Facebook. And as I said earlier, they can search for information about us. My point is all of these technology-related options, which if you look at the history of social work are relatively new. I know that some listeners may have grown up with all of this, but other listeners, it's relatively new in the history of the profession. All of these technology options have created new, unprecedented boundary door relationship challenges. So as I mentioned earlier, many social workers receive Facebook friend requests from clients or former clients. Well, that's a boundary issue. Is it ever appropriate to be a Facebook friend with a current client? What about if the client terminated two years ago? Can you be a Facebook friend with a former client? We never had to ask these questions before, but I think this requires great judgment. The NASW Code of Ethics was relatively recently revised. And as you mentioned in the intro, I was privileged to be part of that, having chaired the task force that wrote the code in the 1990s and with several colleagues recently worked very hard to update that code, primarily to add technology-related standards. And that code now includes several standards that directly pertain to boundary issues associated with social workers' use of technology, having online social networking relationships with current and former clients, whether it is permissible ethically to conduct an online search for information about clients without their knowledge or consent. So that's not just a privacy issue. I would argue that's also a boundary issue. 
Because if we are searching for information about clients online without their knowledge or consent, we are entering into their personal world virtually. And I think we have to think very carefully about whether that's ethical if the client doesn't know we're doing this. And the code of ethics, by the way, what we put in there is that social workers should not conduct those online searches for information about clients without their knowledge or consent. We should not do that. We need to respect their boundaries, their privacy. And we say in the code of ethics, there are some reasonable exceptions to that. As you might imagine, if there are health and safety risks, the client has disappeared, we're really worried about something, there might be a legitimate reason to do that. In addition, as I said, an increasing number of clients, I think, are conducting their own online searches about us. They're curious about our lives. So we're not only finding out information about them, they're finding out information about us. And that is a boundary issue. When they acquire that information that they may bring up in the context of a clinical session, we then have to figure out how to manage that. A client says, hey, I was doing an online search and and I saw somebody with your name was pulled over by the police for a DUI, driving under the influence. Was that you? Well, now suppose it was you. That's a boundary issue where you have to handle the client's question about your personal life. Or the client does an online search and finds out that you've been very active in Black Lives Matter. You've been very active in a particular presidential candidate's campaign. Your name is on the website. So the client just learned personal information about you, about your social justice activities, your political leanings, and might bring that up. So that is not only a clinical issue, but I would say it's a boundary issue because of technology. They might not have ever known that without the availability of search engines, unless you wore a political button in the middle of a clinical session, which, by the way, is also a boundary issue. Whether it's okay to wear a Black Lives Matter button or a political candidate's button. But back to technology, all of these options have created the opportunity for boundary issues we never imagined possible. I'll give you one other example. I know social workers who have been very active in their personal lives on controversial issues related to, let's say, women's reproductive rights. So say you're a clinical social worker and you also are a staunch advocate for women's reproductive rights. And you've been involved in rallies and public campaigns. You were a speaker at a rally regarding a piece of legislation. And somebody at that rally videotaped you. You didn't do it. Somebody else in the crowd did it. And they uploaded that video at the state house at that rally. And you're making comments about abortion. And your client does a search on YouTube, finds that video. Here's you. This is technology. Here's you making strong statements that you're passionate about, and it turns out that your client has views that are diametrically opposed to yours. Let's say, hypothetically, you have a client who has strong faith-based beliefs, which are fine. Everybody's entitled to have their beliefs. And your client is opposed to abortion. And in fact, had an unplanned pregnancy and is wrestling with that decision, that horrible decision, the client says doesn't believe in abortion, believes it's unconscionable, and was curious about you, and you are somebody who spoke at a rally defending women's right to choose, a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. Well, do you think that might have clinical implications? Do you think that might be a boundary issue in the sense that the client is learning about your personal views? Had the client simply asked you that in a clinical session, I embedding that many social workers would say, well, tell me why that's important to you. You know, you learn this in social work school. Tell me why that's important to you. It's not about me. It's about you. And you sort of kind of finesse this situation because you don't want your views to enter into the room, so to speak. But even if you try to finesse it, even if you're not comfortable sharing your personal views on these very complicated issues with clients, clients may find it out because of technology and the search. And there it is on YouTube. So those are just a few examples of how technology, in my opinion, has launched a variety of very complex boundary issues that 
social workers never had to deal with before, at least not in this way. What is an ethical dilemma? And what are some of the important steps social workers can take to handle ethical dilemmas? Well, in a nutshell, I know we don't have a lot of time here, so we can either have the seven-hour interview (laughs) or the... (laughs) So I'll give you the brief version. (laughs) So the brief version goes something like this. An ethical dilemma, in my view, involves conflicting professional obligations and duties. Conflicting or potentially conflicting professional obligations and duties. I don't think all ethical issues involve ethical dilemmas. So, for example, if a clinical social worker is sexually attracted to her or his client, that's not an ethical dilemma. I mean, we know what the answer is. Do not embark on a sexual relationship with a client. End of story. Not a complicated ethical issue. I understand it may be complicated clinically and there may be transference, kind of transference issues and all the rest of it, but we all know what the answer is. An ethical dilemma, in contrast, in my opinion, involves what I call ambidextrous questions. Ambidextrous questions. So, you know, and somebody who's ambidextrous can write with the left hand, the right hand. Well, with regard to ethics, on the one hand, We want to respect clients' privacy. We don't want to invade their privacy. That's an ethical duty. On the other hand, there's the ambidextrous part. On the other hand, are there instances where we as social workers might feel obligated to violate, invade clients' privacy for a compelling reason? Because they're missing in action, we need to find out where they are and we conduct an online search for information about them. We're worried. Or you are a social worker who is conducting home visits. That's part of your job. And you are concerned about safety. You want to find out whether the client whose home you're going to be visiting by yourself, one-on-one with the client who has a criminal record, You want to find out if that person has any history of sex offenses, is a registered sex offender. Where do you draw that line between respecting a client's privacy and searching for information or releasing information in order to protect yourself or third parties? That would be an example of an ethical dilemma. In social work, we often find ourselves caught between a rock and a hard place, ethically. On the one hand, on the other hand. An ethical dilemma is when we encounter these duties and obligations, respect boundaries, respect privacy, respect client self-determination. Oh, wait a minute. Is this an instance where I need to interfere with a client's right to self-determination because I think the client is exercising poor judgment, is posing a threat to him or herself? That's an ethical dilemma. I want to respect my client's right to confidentiality. Of course I do. But I am concerned that the client has threatened to harm a third party, an estranged girlfriend or partner. Do I have a duty to disclose that information without the client's consent to protect that party? So there's a tension between what we are obligated to do on one hand and what we're obligated to do on the other hand, and those may conflict. So those are ethical dilemmas, and they arise with regard to boundaries as well, of course. Now, your question, what do you do? In my opinion, a really skilled social worker takes several steps when they encounter complex boundary challenges. And I don't think all of them are complex. I think some are, some are not. But when they're complex... I would say there are a number of steps that a good social worker should take. Number one, to protect clients. Again, always the first priority, but also to protect the social workers themselves, to prevent the lawsuit that alleges an ethics breach or a boundary violation, to prevent the licensing board complaint that alleges an ethics breach or a boundary violation. And what are those steps? Now, I know some of this may seem pretty obvious. But sometimes I think it's worth stating what should be the obvious. Number one, I would say when in doubt, should I search for information about my client online without my client's knowledge or consent? Should I be answering my client's questions about my personal life? My former client has applied for a job here. Would it be appropriate to hire this former client? My former client has just invited me to go to his wedding. And 
the former client says, look, you, social worker, you're the reason I am emotionally healthy enough to get married. Without you, I'm not sure I'd be doing this. You have made such a difference in my life. I would like you to be at my wedding, going to a client's funeral, accepting a client's gift. All of these boundary-related issues, if they're in the gray zone, you know, some are black and white, you know, don't have sex with the client. That's easy, relatively speaking. But some are in the gray zone where I think reasonable minds can differ. And so step one is to get consultation. If you're in a private practice, that's peer consultation. I don't call that peer supervision because supervision is vertical. Peer consultation is horizontal. If you work in a clinical agency, supervision, in addition to perhaps peer consultation, get consultation, get supervision. I think it's always helpful to have people outside of the case, so to speak, the dilemma, to think with us about how to handle this. I know in my own work, you know, even though I've been doing this a long time, I encounter situations where I have to scratch my head like, oh boy, this is a tough one. Ambidextrous on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm wrestling with it. And I will consult with colleagues. It just so happens I'm lucky. My wife, who's also a social work professor, we work in the same place. We have our whole careers. And so I have like a built-in consultant. And we often spend time when we're not talking about our daughters. We're talking about like, ooh, how would you handle this one? How would you handle that one? And I do this with colleagues, other colleagues as well. Number two, if it's a really tough case, I would consult relevant literature. Now, I understand that the typical social worker is not going to just run off to the library and start reading literature or go to the electronic collection if they have access to it. It'd be a nice thing to do, but do I think the typical social worker has the time or inclination to do that? No. I would say I encourage people to do it, but if I can't read the literature myself, I will try to find people who know that literature on boundary issues in social work, door relationships in social work, ethical standards in social work. The literature often gets introduced as evidence in court cases, in licensing court cases. Exhibit 13 for the state, exhibit four for the plaintiff. The literature literally gets entered into evidence because it's part of what we call the standard of care. Standard of care being what a reasonable and prudent, meaning careful, cautious social worker would do. Third, I would find out what my agency's policies are on these boundary issues. Many agencies have guidelines concerning things like accepting gifts from clients, accepting social invitations from clients, having online relationships with current or former clients. I want to find out what my agency's policies are. If I'm in private practice, you know, I'm the boss, but many of us work for agencies. And also, I want to find out what the laws are in my state. Every state has ethical standards governing social workers who are licensed. And a lot of those standards address boundary issues, relationships with current and former clients. You may have a state law that says, and some states do this, in so many words, you are not allowed to have an intimate or sexual relationship with a former client within two years following termination of services. Right, the two-year-old or the four-year-old or the five-year-old, that's a state law. Well, I'd want to know that. I'm not suggesting that relationship would ever be appropriate, but I'd still want to know what the state law says. Uh, in contrast, the NASW Code of Ethics is also important to consider. That's not a law, although it is cited in many states' social work licensing laws. The NASW Code is cited as part of the law in many states, not all states. Now, I'd want to know what the Social Work Code of Ethics says about relationships with former clients, conducting online searches and all that. And it just so happens that with regard to relationships with former clients, when my colleagues and I wrote the code in the 1990s, we considered what some other professions have done on that issue. Two-year rule, five-year rule with regard to relations, intimate relationships with former clients. And we talked about it at length, and we rejected that approach. So our code, unlike the other helping professions codes, our code says, in effect, once a client, always a client, a client in perpetuity, with some very, very narrow exceptions that are embedded in Section 1.09 of the NASW Code of Ethics. But I think it's important to know what the NASW Code of Ethics says, which, by the way, might be more strict 
than your state law with regard to relationships with former clients. In addition, several other components. In some instances, I would consult a lawyer. Not in all. You know, if a client brings me a plate of chocolate chip cookies with nuts and says, here, I made these for you, and I have to think, ooh, am I allowed to accept this gift from a client? I'm not calling a lawyer. If a client asks me, are you married? Do you have any children? Where do you live? And I think some selected self-disclosure might be appropriate. I'm not calling the agency lawyer to get a consult on that. I think that's ridiculous. But if my agency is considering hiring a former client, and I know there can be complicated boundary issues there, and I'm running the show at that agency, I'm going to consult a lawyer who specializes in professional malpractice, licensing board defense, who thinks about these issues to say, can you take a look at our policies, our guidelines, our protocols? Can you give me some feedback about this? I think a lawyer consult there could be very, very useful. If I am coming up with a social media policy governing boundaries in my agency, I might have a lawyer take a look at it to see whether we're wording things properly or not to protect everybody's boundaries. And then two other things, ethics committees. Many agencies have ethics committees. Not all, not all. Ethics committees have been around since the 1970s. There was a very famous New Jersey case called the Karen Ann Quinlan case. And that case involved a young woman who was in a persistent vegetative state. And there was a dispute between the family, her parents, and the hospital about the termination of her life support. Agonizing decision, of course. And that case ended up going to court. And it's a long story, which I won't get into. But that case, the Quinlan case, led to the creation of the first ethics committee at a hospital. Not to make the decision, but to provide consultation to all the staff. And since then, 1976, hospitals around the globe, a number of mental health agencies around the globe have developed ethics committees whose job is, number one, to consult on difficult cases, not to make binding decisions, but to consult. Number two, to provide training on boundary issues and other ethical issues, develop policies around these boundary issues. So I say if there's an ethics committee available, consult it. National practice standards. In social work, we have practice standards that are promulgated by major national organizations like NASW, the Association of Social Work Boards, the Clinical Social Work Association, Council on Social Work Education, Recently, I chaired a national task force to develop state-of-the-art, ethics-driven standards related to social workers' use of technology. There is a significant section in there on the boundary issues that I mentioned earlier, online social networking relationships, conducting online searches for information. I think a good social worker who faces an ethical dilemma should consult those practice standards, which are freely available on the NASW website. And finally documentation, documentation, documentation. That is, in order to protect everybody, I think it is so important to have a paper trail or an electronic trail, if you use electronic note keeping, where you document with whom did you consult. If you took a look at the code of ethics, what did you pull from that code of ethics? If you consulted the agency's policies, if you consulted with the ethics committee, document every step. Because if questions surface about your judgment in the context of a lawsuit or a licensing board complaint, people can always disagree with your judgment on all those boundary issues that I mentioned. But if you have in your notes details about the consultation you obtained, the steps you took to examine policies, code of ethics standards, and all of that, it shows a good faith effort on your part. And that counts for an awful lot if you're trying to defend yourself. So Dr. Reamer, what do I do if I have a client who I've been treating for a couple of weeks in my private practice, which is located in my community? By chance, I run into that same client at one of my children's school functions. What do I do? Let me start at the beginning. All social workers are taught that when you begin working with a client, there are certain things you should do. Of course, you conduct the comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment check. You discuss confidentiality guidelines, right? Everybody gives a speech about how 
important confidentiality is and what goes on in this room stays in this room, whether it's the physical room or the Zoom room kind of thing. And you also go over confidentiality exceptions, right? So every clinical social worker knows that speech. And you talk about threat to self and threat to others. And if you have a court order, not a subpoena, by the way, that's different, a court order. And what you might be disclosing to your supervisor for clinical supervision. So I, you go over all this stuff and you document the fact that you had that conversation. That's key. Okay, so we're all used to that. This is my suggestion. We add another item to that list if we don't already do that. And I think this should be standard. And it goes something like this in the scenario that you described. So, you know, we are living and working in a relatively small community. And there is a possibility that we will encounter each other in the community. So I want to talk with you about how I handle that. Should it happen? I will not approach you. It's not because I don't like you. It's because I want to respect the boundaries. I want to respect your privacy. So just know that if we bump into each other at a supermarket or a synagogue or a church or a mosque or wherever, I am not going to approach you. And that's why. Don't Please don't be insulted. It's possible that in this community, we know people in common. We might end up in the same social situation because of that. So I want you to know if that should happen, here's how I would handle it and why. And in this day and age, I would add that we can't be Facebook friends. You know, I would talk about the online stuff as well. My point being, just like we have gotten so used to in social work, we have gotten so used to giving the confidentiality speech along with the exceptions. I think we need to add a brief, it doesn't have to be an hour long, it can be relatively brief, discussion of boundaries. And how we manage those. And I think addressing those up front, and by the way, documenting the fact that we had that conversation, is the best way to prevent problems in this scenario that you described. And I want to reiterate, I would include the online social networking, Facebook kinds of connections. So that, to go back to your question, if you have a private practice if you work at a mental health agency and you think there's a reasonably good chance you will encounter a client in the community, I would not wait for that to happen. I would anticipate it. And by broaching it at the front end, in my experience, in my experience, it greatly increases the likelihood. It'll be a non-issue. So you end up encountering that client at the school play because both of your kids are in the school play or at church, or synagogue, or the supermarket, or the gym, the beach, wherever. And should that happen, you kind of give each other the look, the knowing look. And the client knows you've already talked about this. So the client understands why you're keeping your distance, and it's not insulted. And then at the next session, you can say, how about that? We bumped into each other at the kid's play. You know, what did you think of the play? For two minutes. And you just sort of process what happened, but the client's not surprised. I think if you will, sort of the preemptive strike is the way to do this up front and in advance. I agree. So Dr. Reber, on behalf of myself and my listeners and all of the people that you've helped your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand boundary issues in social work practice. It's my pleasure. And I thank you for having me. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system, or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so that you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There's no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.